Okay. Uh, looks like uh, we should get started. We're already 10 minutes late uh, from our starting time. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, on behalf of uh, ED and uh, the ACA Congress, I would like to welcome you all to the opening session of this inaugural International Rice Business uh, Center <laughs> Policy Conference. And this, is the, this is a brand new conference. This is the first time uh, we are organizing this conference uh, within IRC. Uh, before, I, before I go any further, uh, let me just tell you we have uh, listened to many speakers this morning on the significance or importance of investment and policy uh, with respect to global food security. Uh, let, me just, uh, let me just go back to our first keynote speaker this morning, uh, the IFAT president. Uh, what he, he put it very eloquently that uh, we are at a very crossroad right now. We have two paths ahead of us. The first path is we do nothing, which is the least resistance and face the consequence what happens in the future. The second path is a difficult one with what it means to invest in agriculture to secure a bright and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and secure future for the future generations. This conference is all about making sure we take the right path in the future so that uh, the food security for the, for the global, uh, the, for the world, is secured for a long time to come. And this particular forum is designed to discuss and present uh, key issues on investment and policies that will be needed for a successful realization <coughs> of the second green revolution. We already listened to many speakers this morning. We had uh, we have a plenary debate. There was a lot of discussion on what needs needed to be done to secure global rice supply in the future there. Uh, one of the major objectives when we are brainstorming what uh, we should be doing uh, within IRC, uh, one of the things we thought it would be very good uh, to provide a platform uh, for, the, for the government officials, for policy makers, to showcase their, 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 their investment opportunity in the country to donors, to corporate, uh, the private investors, uh, NGOs, uh, and all the stakeholders uh, in hand. Hopefully, We'll have next two days, uh, Lord, we are going to hear uh, experts from both private sectors and public sectors talk about uh, uh, investment requirement in the rice supply chains and policy needed both at the uh, local level, national level, global level <coughs> to secure the food supply <coughs> and hopefully we'll have enough time to network with this uh, unique group of people uh, which includes uh, experts from both private sector and public sector. I think that's probably the uniqueness of this conference is there's, there's something for everybody from every sector. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have a meaningful discussion, meaningful presentations and good interaction. Please don't feel, uh, to, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing called stupid questions. Any question you have, feel, feel free to ask it. Uh, we'll have enough time uh, after, this, uh, after the presentations to have a very interactive discussion there. And this afternoon, for this opening session, we have three excellent presentations. Uh, each of the presenters will give a very brief 20-minute start. And after that, we'll have uh, uh, close to 30 minutes uh, discussion and question answer <coughs> from the floor. Uh, with that, uh, uh, let me invite our first speaker uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Sam Dryden. He's the director. Uh, the head of the Agricultural Development and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Mr. Dryden has extensive experience on food security and economic development. He has worked in Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, Latin America, Middle East, that means all over the world. And prior to joining uh, the foundation, he served as the managing director of uh, World Trans <coughs> Company, a corporate advisory and investment fund founded by the former World Bank president. Uh, he has also served as an advisor on rural development uh, for the World Bank, World Bank and Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, until 2006, he led emergent genetics, which develops and market seeds. So he has extensive experience both in, from the private sector, uh, semi-government, uh, global international organizations, and he also served on many other boards, including Global Crop Diversity Trust, uh, South North Development Initiative and many other boards. Uh, today, he is going to focus his presentation on rice, the significance of rice, and nobody can beat rice. That is the, that's the theme of his presentation. With that, uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Dryden. Uh, 
I have a call, so if I weren't aware that she wouldn't hear me at all. So let me just begin the sentence. It's a pleasure to be back in Vietnam, especially uh, to celebrate 50 years of, uh, of the great work that the Erie's been doing. I was thinking back that the first time that uh, I went to Erie was, was a little over 25 years ago when the Rockefeller Brothers Fund had uh, put together a, a study group to look at whether there was actually an impending technology gap between the developed countries and developing countries in the plant sciences. Uh, there had been great strides that had been made in the plant sciences, uh, particularly in uh, the uh, western crops of, of, uh, of corn and soybean. <laughs> but uh, we were concerned that uh, there, no one was really focusing on rice. And so, uh, they put together a study group, and uh, it did look like there was an impending gap. That was the first time I went to Erie. Subsequently, I visited Erie a number of times as a member of the advisory panel of the Rockefeller Foundation's advisory board on uh, rice biotechnology. Uh, this was a highly successful program that linked young researchers from all over Asia with the leading uh, labs in the U.S. and Western Europe. Uh, to develop new rice technologies. And as a result of that program, rice has become a model crop. It's on equal footing with any of the other uh, commodity crops. And uh, it benefits from cutting edge research all over Asia and uh, at Erie. And it's because of that program where the uh, Rockefeller Foundation put together. It's important because rice isn't just another commodity, and Erie will never be just another research institution. Not only does half the world's population depend upon rice for substance, it's the principal source of income for millions in Africa and Asia. It's indispensable, as we've heard this morning, to local cultures, to human welfare, to national stability, and, and I even dare say to national security. So rice will always be a national priority and an international imperative. But unlike other commodities, rice doesn't benefit from large global research programs within the private sector, nor from um, the, within the large land grant university system. That means that here, along with the national agricultural research programs, are our best hope for solutions to feeding the poor and helping small farmers lift their families out of poverty. And the challenges are only compounded by what we heard this morning. People talk about the environmental pressures, the rising energy prices, and population growth. So, as the Director of the Agricultural Development Program for the Gates Foundation, I have the privilege of working with colleagues such as Prabhu to continue a distinguished history of foundation <coughs> support for Erie. So, philanthropy has played a key role in the history of, of Erie. As most of you know the story, the Rockefeller Foundation, together with the Ford Foundation, came together to form Erie. Ford Foundation built physical infrastructure and the Rockefeller Foundation uh, covered the operating costs. As, as a result of that, Asian price production doubled from the mid-1960s to 1990, outstripping population growth and averting a crisis. The effort was so successful that Ford and Rockefeller then went on and replicated the model to address other crops and other geographies which will eventually led to the formation of the Consulting Group for International Agricultural Research, the CGIR, which had the enthusiastic support of not only the World Bank, but the developed country donor community. <clears throat> Yet despite the success and the proven record of return on investment in, in uh, crop improvements, donors eventually began to wane. Donor support eventually began to wane. In the early 1970s, nearly 75% of the CGIR's budget went for crop productivity improvement. But in the early 2000s, this had dropped to only one third. At the same time, the rice prices had dropped by about 15% per year between 1996 and 2001. So it appeared that the problems with rice production had been solved and donors decided to put their money elsewhere. Then, as we heard again and again this morning, in 2008, the food crisis struck and caught the world off guard. And now, after, in the aftermath of the global recession, the FAO 
tells us that there's over one billion people undernourished worldwide. So the Gates Foundation, at the Gates Foundation, we're guided by the belief that everyone should have the opportunity for a healthy and productive life. We also believe that agricultural development, and particularly crop productivity, is central to creating that opportunity. So revitalization of crop breeding programs is one of our top priorities, which is the reason we support ERI. ERI is among our top grantees and is one of our most valued <coughs> partners. ERI and the other CG centers are critical to ensuring the development of important global public goods. To that end, we provide the CG with about $70 million each year, 80% of which goes to crop improvement. In the past three years, we've invested over $50 million in the area to address smallholder rice productivities. For example, we're funding the Stress Tolerant Rice for Africa and South Asia program, or STRASA as it's known, to help develop new varieties of rice that can withstand, withstand extreme weather. The STRASA project has already demonstrated success in India, where we're working with the Indian government as a partner. We've been able to quickly release and disseminate these stress tolerant rice lines to smallholder farmers. We're also working with ERI and USAID on the cereal system initiative for South Asia, known as CISA, to increase cereal yields. Among other things, this innovative program uses cell phone technology to send information about weather, about markets, and recommendations for appropriate cultivation techniques. This means farmers now are just a phone call away from a more productive crop. To tackle malnutrition, we're working with Erie, with Syngenta, and with the Syngenta Foundation on the development of golden rice, a new variety fortified with vitamin A. Tens of millions of children suffer from vitamin A deficiency. The World Health Organization says as many as a half a million of them go blind each year. So if we can use rice to deliver this important micronutrient, we can make a crucial difference in people's lives. In all these areas, we're using technology to catalyze meaningful change. More importantly, we're working with Erie in partnership with others. Partnerships are critical to our success. But to meet future challenges, I believe it's time to update the traditional relationship between Erie and the national programs. Over the past couple of decades, a number of very strong NARS national agricultural research systems have emerged in Asia. It's time for them to assume a more leadership role for regional research and free URI up to focus on innovative discovery research and dissemination. For example, we're working with the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences to disseminate a stress variety, stress resistant variety called green super rice which is more efficient in its use of water and nitrogen to produce higher yields. We're also supporting research led by a consortium of scientists from Erie and China to transform rice from a C3 plant to a C4 plant, making its biochemical process more energy efficient and saving scarce water and nitrogen supplies. No doubt the greatest global challenge we face though is in Africa. As the Rockefeller Foundation did in the 1990s to bridge the impending technology gap, we need to engage the talents of the leading Asian national programs along with ERI in building a strong rice research capacity in Africa. Today, Africa is the home of 19 out of 20 lowest human development indexes and suffers from disproportionate poverty and hunger. 